So we want to take a moment here to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for today's Family Medicine Grand Rounds on May 18th. Um, for those who are interested in CME credit, do take note of the activity code for today. Um, I'll put that information here in the chat box in just a moment, but you'll want to remember to do that registration before midnight tonight if you are wanting the credit. So in the next slide here, I will go through the process very briefly. Um, but if you have not yet registered, please make sure that you send your email address to the toll-free number listed there. After you've registered from that point forward, you just need to send attend and then the code for today, which is listed, um, text that to the same number and then you should get confirmation that you are registered. But if you're having any issues, please feel free to contact me again. Make sure you do that before midnight tonight. Next slide. So as we begin here, as you already know, um, if you can make sure that your microphone is muted as we get started. And then of course, again, being attentive and engaged in this session. Um, if you do have questions, we're gonna ask that you either hold those to the end or put those in the chat box and we will take a look at those after the presentation is finished. Um, and then also in the chat box towards the end of the presentation, I will be putting in the evaluation link. So if you can help us out with that and provide um, some feedback on the session. Next slide. So as you all know, this is the South Texas Regional Family Medicine Grand Rounds. We wanna make sure that we do mention we are partnered with the South Central Area AHEC, and it is our mission statement listed there um, if you are interested. Next slide. CME, again, going back to that, if you do claim CME credit, you may wanna take a look at your transcript every so often, um, just to make sure that you are receiving those credits for the sessions you attend. You can visit our CME website, um, our CME office's website. Um, it's listed there, but if you have any questions about your transcript, you can reach out to them and you're also more than welcome to reach out to me as well. Next slide. That transcript is needed. If you are an AAFP member, you may also wanna claim credit through the AAFP. Um, so if you have any questions regarding um, any of the CME or AAFP credits, you can certainly reach out to those organizations, but I am also available um, at your convenience. Next slide. We also do need to mention, or we want to make sure that we mention that it is our goal during these sessions to make sure that we uh, meet the competencies listed here uh, for each of the uh, nationally established physician core competencies. Um, so those are listed there for you to take a look at if you're interested. Next slide. We also need to just mention that our speaker, Dr. Godinez and Dr. Davidson, his mentor, have no financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. And today's topic is double the trouble, double the fun, treatment approach for double diabetes. So I will let Dr. Godinez go ahead with his presentation. Thank you so much, Ms. Rubio. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is William Godinez. I am the current PGY2 Amcare Pharmacy resident with University Health. And so today, like we discussed, we're gonna be talking about double the trouble, double the fun, treatment approaches for double diabetes. So here are our learning objectives for today. First, we will describe the pathogenesis of double diabetes. Next, we will evaluate the available literature regarding the efficacy and safety of adjuncts of non-insulin agents, more specifically focus more on insulin sensitizers in type one diabetics with clinical features of type two diabetes. Once we're comfortable with all that information, we'll use what we've learned to help formulate the most appropriate evidence-based treatment approach for a patient diagnosed with double diabetes. So here we have RM. He's a 41-year-old male with a past, past medical history of type 1 and hypertension. He was diagnosed with type 1 when he was hospitalized for DKA at a young age. And since then, he has recently hospitalized for DKA and pancreatitis back in 2018. You may know RM as a daring and strong bouncer at Patty's Pub. But since the COVID pandemic hit, he's been eating and sitting around a lot more, as you can see here. He's noticed that his sugars have been significantly higher, even with increased insulin requirements, with a total daily insulin of about one unit per kg per day. You draw some labs for RM, and indeed you find that his sugars have been high as his A1C increased to 10.6%. Given all this information, 
what do you think we should do to help RM get his diabetes back on track? Should we A, adjust his total daily insulin and initiate bioglitazone 30 milligrams once daily? B, adjust his total daily insulin and initiate metformin 500 milligram daily? C, adjust his insulin and initiate loragotide 1.2 milligrams sub Q once daily? Or D, nothing. He needs to start off by helping Charlie or with some Charlie work around the bar. Now, before we shout out or type out any answers in the chat, I would like for everyone to hold on to them as we'll revisit RM throughout the rest of this day or our presentation to learn how we can best get his diabetes back on track. So it may seem that all we talk about in the ambulatory care setting is diabetes all the time. And that's because it's very prevalent in the United States. In fact, it's estimated that 34.2 million Americans are currently living with diabetes, with 5.2% of those having type 1. Speaking a little closer to home, almost 11.6% of our Sweet Bear County has diabetes, which you think would might be a little bit more given all the tortillas and the Tex-Mex food we have here. Talking more specifically on type 1, generally most patients are lean at diagnosis. However, they are, it's becoming more common for patients to be overweight and obese at the, type, at the time of diagnosis for type 1. So as a little refresher, here are two, main co two common types of diabetes. Type one, which is due to autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells, which ultimately leads to insulin deficiency. And type two, which is due to progressive pancreatic beta cell dysfunction, insulin resistance in the peripheral tissues, such as the muscular, liver, um, and fat tissues, and impaired incretin effect. Now you may be saying to yourself, that's great and all, you know, I've learned what type one and type two is back in medical school or whatever health professional school you went to. But what you may not have known is that there actually is another common type of diabetes known as double diabetes, which is used to describe a specific type one subgroup characterized by the coexistence of type two clinical features of insulin resistance. In fact, the first description of double diabetes dates as far back to 1991 when type one individuals were found to have at least one relative with type two diabetes that had worse glycemic control with high insulin requirements and tended to have higher body weight compared to those with type one who didn't have a family history of type two diabetes. In a recent cross-sectional cross study, it was estimated that 53.3% of patients who were overweight and obese that had type one had double diabetes, which used a specific diagnostic criterion that I'll briefly go into later in this presentation. Currently, the proposed risk criteria on identifying double diabetes to date relies on the presence of these three clinical markers. First, it's possible that individuals with type 1 have genetic predisposition to insulin resistance, particularly in those with a family history of type 2 diabetes, with the greatest risk seen in those who have more than or equal to two relatives with type two diabetes. Next, under an intensive insulin therapy, type one patients are likely to gain additional weight due to just the anabolic nature of insulin, which can contribute to insulin resistance. Even in patients with initial good insulin sensitivity and no family history of type two, they're still at risk of becoming overweight and obese just due to a poor healthy lifestyle. In fact, it has been shown that a patient who has a BMI of greater than or equal to 30 are at high risk of developing insulin resistance. And lastly, and most importantly, is insulin resistance itself. As the use of higher insulin requirements, such as a total daily insulin of one unit per cake per day, can likely contribute to the risk of insulin resistance. And the development of insulin resistance can really vary as it can occur later in the course of someone's type one diagnosis or can actually be present at diagnosis, just kind of depending if there's other clinical factors such as weight and family history of type two are present. Now, while family history of type two, weight or insulin itself should not be used solely to diagnose double diabetes, each may serve as an important clinical marker to help identify those who may be at high risk of having double diabetes. Okay, now how do we measure whether if someone has insulin resistance or not? Well, tools we help you measure this include the euglycemic hyperinsulinic clamp. And this is the gold standard method to measure insulin sensitivity in vivo. However, due to its invasive 
uh, and time consuming nature, it's likely not suitable for general clinical practice. And therefore brings the use of the clinical friendly alternative, the estimated glucose disposable rate that can help estimate insulin resistance as shown with this equation here and taking consideration these patients factors such as BMI, hypertension, and their current A1C. In studies, it has been shown that an EGDR value of less than eight is suitable to identify those at risk of having double diabetes. Here is a diagram I created to really provide a big picture explanation of how insulin resistance occurs. It all starts off with chronic excessive food intake, which ultimately leads to adipocyte insulin hypoxia and death due to overt, overt lipid accumulation. This then leads to adipocyte insulin resistance to prevent further enlargement of other adipose cells, <clears throat> as well as recruitment of macrophages to the cells as well. Inflammatory singling in these macrophages then leads to increased in inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. These cytokines then further contribute to adipocyte insulin resistance, as well as increased lipolysis, specifically more in the visceral adipose tissue, which then leads to the production of free fatty acids and glycerol. The increase in free circulating free fatty acids and glycerol has a direct and indirect stimulatory effect on gluconeogenesis within the liver. That ultimately promotes hepatic insulin resistance. And lastly, the circulating free fatty acids facilitates lipid accumulation in the muscle tissue, which then consequently promotes muscular insulin resistance. And so in summary, chronic excessive food intake promotes lipid accumulation within these peripheral tissues to promote, to promote overall peripheral insulin resistance. Now, I would like for you to keep this diagram in mind as I will discuss a little later on how our insulin sensitizing agents work within this process. So here's a quick knowledge check for you. Which of the following is true regarding the pathogenesis of double diabetes of what we just, just, just talked about? Is it A, a family history of type two is the only criteria to play a role in the diagnosis of double diabetes? B, the incidence of overweight and obesity in type one is decreasing? C, an EGDR value of greater than or equal to eight is considered insulin resistant? Or D, a family history of type two obesity and in high insulin requirements are all clinical markers of double diabetes. And you can either shout out the answer or just type it into the Zoom chat. Oh, I see D is the first one. Yes, perfect. So I would agree, D. All of these characteristics play a major role in the pathogenesis of double diabetes. Now let's shift our attention to treatment strategies for double diabetes. Like type one and type two non-pharmacologic recommendations, there is an emphasis on lifestyle modifications to improve insulin resistance, such as diet, having a significant decrease in the amount of carbohydrates, as well as, as, well as saturated and trans fat intake, exercise, increasing regular exercise, and of course, smoking and alcohol cessation. When it comes to pharmacologic treatment, what do the guidelines mention about the use of non-insulin agents in type one with insulin resistance? Well, the 2022 ADA Standards of Care supports the use of the uh, amylimic, amylin mimetic pernilimetide as the only adjunct of therapy to insulin in type 1 patients. The AACE ACE 2015 guidelines actually don't support the use of any adjunct of therapy to insulin. And lastly comes the UK NICE 2015 guidelines, which state one may consider metformin as adjunct of insulin therapy if they have a BMI of greater than or equal to 25, and there's a desire to improve glycemic control while reducing insulin dose. Now, one, I'll take a may consider any time of the day when we don't really have that clear information on how to treat these types of patients. But two, in the end of it all, as practitioners, isn't our end goal for these patients to decrease their insulin requirements while also improving their glycemic control? With all of this, there isn't really clear cut clinical guidance on the use of insulin sensitizers. So what should we do? Well, the cornerstone treatment for type, of type, for type one is exclusively based on insulin replacement therapy. The only FDA approved non-insulin agent for the use in type one patients, however, is the primalimetide. But given its frequency of dosing, which means adding on an additional three injections to the patient's already established basal bolus insulin regimen, 
<clears throat> Adverse effect profiles such as nausea and stomach issues, as well as its costs, def definitely limits its use. Currently, aside from insulin and perlimatide, there are 10 FDA approved non-insulin agents listed here for type two. And as you can see, there's no medication specifically approved to treat double diabetes. And so there is definitely a need for agents acting through insulin independent pathways to improve glycemic control, weight, and insulin resistance in double diabetes, all without causing hypoglycemia. So it is speculated that insulin sensitizing agents, such as metformin, GLP-1s, and TZDs, can improve glycemic control, at least in part, by reducing insulin requirements. So stay tuned to see if we can use these agents in these in double diabetic patients. So here we have another knowledge check for you. RC is a 43-year-old male with type 1 who comes to our clinic for an initial visit. His most recent BMI is 23 kilograms per meter squared. He reports polyuria, polydipsia, and average blood glucose levels of a 283. He reports administering insulin Dutchmere 66 units once daily and insulin less pro 12 units with meals plus a correction factor with a total daily, total daily insulin of greater than one unit per day per day. His current A1C is 10%. Given all this, does RC have risk factors for insulin resistance? Is it A? Nope. Yes, he does, but his B is why DMI is overweight. B is yes, his TDI is elevated. C, no, A1, A1C is pretty okay for the, his age. Or D, no, is it, he has insulin sensitive and given all the reported symptoms he has. And again, you can share your answers via voice or in the chat. There we go. Looks like that's our cue. So yes, um, given his TDI or total data insulin is greater than one, so that does have risk factor for insulin resistance. Now, insulin sensitizing agents provide beneficial effects among insulin resistance by improving, as you can tell by their name, insulin sensitivity and glycemic control. First, metformin works by suppressing hepatic glucose production and increasing insulin sensitivity at the peripheral tissues. Next. TZDs are potent and selective agonists for PPAR gamma, which in turn improves insulin sensitivity at peripheral tissues. Additionally, activation of the receptor provides gene products involved in visceral lipid metabolism, which is a good thing as we previously discussed, since excess visceral lipids can be linked to insulin resistance. And lastly, our good GLP-1 receptor agonists, which directly stimulate GLP-1 receptors, which then leads to glucose-dependent insulin resistance or secretion of glucose dependent, or sorry, leads to glucose dependent insulin secretion. Inhibition of glucagon release slows gastric emptying and increases satiety. Additionally, GLP-1s have also been shown to improve insulin sensitivity through unknown mechanisms to believe to be through anti-inflammatory modulating effects. Given the benefits of these agents, they have shown on decreasing insulin requirements in type 2 patients, they hold great potential as acceptable agents in type 1 patients in double diabetic patients. The use of these agents have all, may also provide vascular beneficial effects in double diabetes, as seen in previous trials with type 2 patients, including weight loss, cardiovascular, and renal benefits. With all benefits, however, do come some limitations. Metformin should be avoided in impaired renal function, and side effects include such as nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, which are very common, especially upon init initial start or initial uh, start therapy. Fortunately, extended release formulations help reduce these side effects. With TZDs, they should be avoided in a New York Heart Association class greater than or equal to three heart failure, as well as severe liver disease. And common side effects include weight gain and peripheral edema. And lastly, with GLP-1 receptor agonists, 
They should be avoided in those with a history of acute or chronic pancreatitis, as well as gastroparesis. And common side effects include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, especially upon initiation. So if missed the inexperience with double diabetes and its therapeutic management, it is something that is quite common in clinic. So this brings to question, what role do adjunctive insulin sensitizing agents have in the management of double diabetes? To answer this, I explored the depths of PubMed by including studies in which insulin sensitizers were evaluated in type one with clinical features of insulin resistance. And so I gathered these three promising randomized control trials and I'll go through them one by one in the order in which they're approved for diabetes treatment. And the spirit of my It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia theme, I've identified each study with the help from the gang. First trial up is Libig and colleagues, represented here by Sweet D. The objective of the study was to assess the efficacy and safety of metformin as adjunct to insulin therapy. This was a multi-center, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized control trial including overweight and obese adolescent patients with uncontrolled type one on basal bolus insulin therapy. Each participant was randomly assigned either metformin or placebo in addition to their established insulin regimen. The primary endpoint of the study was change in A1C from baseline to week 26 with secondary endpoints, including analyzing the change in total daily insulin and BMI change. Both groups were well matched, with both having an average age of 15 years, an A1C of near 8.8%, and a mean total daily insulin of 1.1 units per kg per day. Participants had a mean metformin dose of approximately 1,700 milligrams, with 83% of those having metformin adherence over the 26 weeks. The figure here represents the primary endpoint, which was change in A1C from baseline to week 13 and 26 weeks. Each whole box represents the interquartile range, with the horizontal box representing the median and the circle in the side of the box representing the mean. The black box represents the placebo group, where the A1C was increased by a mean of 0.2% over 26 weeks. The white box represents the metformin group where the A1C was also increased by a mean of 0.2%. And there is no statistical difference in the glycemic control seen between both groups at week 26 weeks. At 26 weeks. However, there was a significant per percent change in A1C from baseline to week 13 for metformin compared to placebo with a mean difference of approximately negative 0.3%. On to our secondary outcomes, we see that the mean difference in total daily insulin per kilogram was lower in metformin than placebo at both week 13 and week 26 from baseline. Similar results were seen in a BMI percentile and body weight change, favoring a decreased trend with metformin use. And of interest, Libin and colleagues perform exploratory analysis on inflammatory markers and unfortunately, they did not find a significant difference in the change of interleukin-6 levels from baseline to week 26. And for safety, there was a significant difference in the number of GI adverse drug events seen with metformin. However, there was no specifics on what those exactly were. And 7% of the metformin participants had at least one or greater than uh, severe hypoglycemic event. In conclusion, women and colleagues found that metformin use in type one overweight and obese adolescents was not associated with improvements in glycemic control after six months. However, findings did favor for decreased insulin dose and measures of weight at the increased risk of GI adverse events, which we know is fairly common with metformin use, especially upon initiation, and their potential for severe hypoglycemia. Overall, Libin and colleagues had a well-developed study design, which helped minimize bias. It's also reassuring that both treatment groups were matched at baseline, both study drug completion rates were near 100%, and both intention to treat and per, per, cutout, per protocol analysis were matched. Some limitations of the study included that it was a small sample size, 
and it focused on adolescent and more white race po patient population, which limits its generalizability in adults and other populations. And lastly, changes in participants' insulin regimen was left at the discretion of the treating clinician rather than using a specific protocol. This may have made it difficult to determine to what extent the reductions in total daily insulin had in the metformin group uh, on the impact showing a significant difference in the A1C between groups. And so bottom line, adjunctive metformin use is not more effective than insulin alone for glycemic control in overweight and obese type one adolescent patients, but may provide some role in prevention of weight gain and also avoid increases in total daily insulin. I also wanted to mention this systematic review for completeness sake, as it found that metformin was associated with a decrease in insulin dose requirements, an A1C, and a decrease in weight. Overall, metformin was shown to be well tolerated, but with a general trend towards higher hypoglycemic events. So here we have another quick knowledge check. Based on GI adverse drug events seen in the Libin study, which intervention may improve metformin's GI tolerability? Is it A, take metformin on an empty stomach, B, switch metformin to extended release, C, hold metformin until our next primary care visit, or D, just let sweet D tell a joke. Now I'm sure we've come across this situation plenty of times during practice. Yes, correct, B. I would switch to metformin extended release. Remember that the extended release helps minimize GI symptoms by almost 40% when compared to the immediate release tablet. Our next insulin sensitizer agent up is pioglitazone, represented by the most adored art collector, Ongo Gopogian, which is Zerdrogovic and colleagues study. And this aim to assess whether the addition of pioglitazone to standard insulin therapy improves glycemic control and clinical evidence of insulin resistance in adolescents. This was a small, double-blind, placebo-controlled, two-site, randomized controlled trial, including adolescents with type 1, high insulin requirements, and clinical, uh, sorry, high insulin requirements and suboptimal glycemic control. Each participant was randomly assigned to either pioglitazone or placebo therapy in addition to their established insulin regimen. The primary endpoint of the study was to assess the change in A1C from baseline to E26, with secondary endpoints including analyzing the change in insulin dose and DMI. Like how I mentioned, relatively small study sample. Both groups were well matched with an A1C near of 8.8%, mean BMI of 25 kilograms per meter squared, and a total daily insulin of approximately 1.4 units per keg per day. And here's what they found. After 26 weeks of therapy, there was a negative 0.4% mean change in A1C for pioglitazone. However, the difference between both groups was not statistically different. There was no difference in the change in total daily insulin dose between both groups. And to measure change in weight, they used a BMI standard deviation score, which saw a significant increase in the pioglitazone group, suggesting that those experienced treatment-related weight gain. Now, Zdrogovic and colleagues proposed that the improved A1C in both groups without change in total daily insulin is possibly due to better compliance with the patient's diet insulin therapy, or frequent contact with the study team. Pioglitazone had some weight gain during the study without an increase in insulin, again, suggesting that this was potentially due to TZD therapy itself. As we know, a common adverse event effect of TZDs or pioglitazone is uh, weight gain and peripheral edema. Now, it's great that Zorakovic and colleagues provided insight on yet another insulin sensitizer that is actually known to have higher peripheral insulin sensitivity compared to metformin, but unfortunately, these findings were limited by its small sample size and adolescent population. Also, it excluded those with a BMI greater than two standard deviation scores 
to avoid inclusions of those likely of having clinical features of type 2 diabetes, which essentially kind of eliminates the patient population that we're really interested in. And so to summarize, bottom line, adjunctive pioglitazone was not associated with improvements in glycemic control with then insulin alone and the cost, but at the cost of increased weight gain, which may not make TZDs or pioglitazone and have such an appealing option for obese and overweight type 1 individuals. Our final study up is Matthew and colleagues that investigates one of our more popular drug classes in diabetes today, and that is our GLP-1 receptor agonist, represented here by Charlie or Damon. They aim to determine whether loragotide added to treatment, treat to target insulin, improve glycemic control, and reduce insulin requirements and body weight over time. This was a large 52 weeks study yet was yet again a randomized double-blind treat-to-target multicenter phase three trial, including adults with type one on stable basal bolus or continuous sub-Q insulin infusion regimen for at least three months prior. Each participant was randomly assigned either loragotide 0.6, 1.2, 1.8, or placebo therapy in addition to their established treat-to-target insulin regimen. Loragotide doses were titrated from 0.6 every other week until target doses were achieved, and total daily insulin was reduced by 25% initially at baseline and an additional 10% on subsequent days of dose escalation of loragotide. The primary endpoint of the study was to assess the change in A1C, body weight, and total daily insulin dose, with safety, safety endpoints including symptomatic hypoglycemia, and hyperglycemia with ketosis, which was defined as plasma ketones greater than 1.5 millimoles per liter. And yeah, it was a pretty big trial consisting of almost 1400 patients. Participants were similar across treatment groups with an A1C of 8.2% and a mean BMI of about 29.5 kilograms per meter squared. In terms of our primary outcome, let's first look at the change in A1C over 52 weeks. There was a significant dose-dependent A1C reduction seen with loragotide 1.2 and 1.8 compared with placebo. But as you can see, most of that decrease occurred within the baseline, from baseline to up until about 12 weeks, after which A1C levels gradually started to increase towards baseline by the end of week 52. Looking at the effect of total daily insulin dose, it decreased from baseline to week 52 by 5% in the 1.8 milligram loragotide and 2% in the 1.2 milligram strain and increased actually by 4% in the 0.6 milligram strain. Lastly, with change in body weight, you can see that there is a significant difference in reduced body weight across all loragotide groups with loss of four kilograms, 2.7 kilograms, and 1.3 kilograms for loragotide 1.8, 1.2, and 0.6 milligrams respectively. Moving on to our safety analysis, the rates of symptomatic hypoglycemia were significantly increased with 1.8 milligrams and 1.2 milligrams of loragotide. Furthermore, hyperglycemia with ketosis increased significantly with 1.8 milligrams of ragatide dose. And lastly, as expected with GLP-1 receptor agonists, GI events were more common with loragotide, with nausea being the most frequently reported issue. So in conclusion, Matthew and colleagues demonstrated that in a general population of type 1, type one uh, individuals, loragotide provided a modest dose-dependent A1C reduction despite a reduced total daily insulin requirement. Now, although the reasoning for these observations are unclear, they anticipate that the reduction in A1C could be due to loragotide reducing postprandial blood glucose levels and glucose excretions. In terms of body weight, a reduction of up to approximately five kilograms was achieved in those receiving loragotide 1.8 milligram, which is comparable to other previous studies. 
And lastly, Matthew and colleagues suggest that the increase in symptomatic hypoglycemia may be due, due to imparted by the protocol-driven insulin titration schedule, which may have been mitigated if there is a more flexible titration schedule used. And the increase in hyperglycemia with ketosis could have potentially been due to that subsequent percent decrease in insulin doses when titrating loragotide. As for a patient who was on loragotide 1.8, could have seen almost anywhere to between 45 to 50% decrease in their total daily insulin requirements over that four, a four week period. Some strengths of the study include that this being the largest and first year long randomized controlled trial evaluating GLP-1 receptor use in type one patients. And some limitations of the study include that they um, had patients with a severe history of severe uh, hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia unawareness, as well as those with a history uh, or prone to ketoacidosis, which could account for these increased rates of these events. Additionally, as mentioned, a more flexible insulin titration schedule may have mitigated the risk of hypoglycemia. As treat to target, likely attributed to that increase in total daily insulin to base back to baseline at week 52, um, given that clinicians may have been a little more aggressive to reach the study outcomes. And so to summarize, although loragotide has benefits in reducing A1C, body weight, and insulin dose, clinical utility may be limited due to its risk of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia with ketosis. Now, based on the results from Libin and colleagues, they show, sorry, excuse me. Now, <laughs> looking at another knowledge check, a CDI or CD is a 53-year-old male with a past medical history of type 1 hyperlipidemia and CAD and hypertension. And he has a his family history of type 2. Recently, his endocrinologist added metformin 500 milligram once daily to his regimen of insulin glargine 57 units once daily and insulin aspart 15 units with meals plus correction factor. And so his current A1C is 8.9%. Based on the available literature, what outcomes would you expect for med performance therapy? Would it be A, increase in peripheral uh, edema, B, no effect on total daily insulin, C, reduction in interleukin-6 levels by 11.2%, 11, 11 or D, A1C reduction to approximately 8.6%. So given what we learned with uh, that study with Libin and colleagues, we saw that there was about a negative 0.3 decrease at week 13. So I'd expect with this patient's A1C currently 8.9 at week 13, we could see approximate reduction to 8.6%. And so wrapping it all up, based on our studies, we can say that metformin showed benefits with reduction in body weight and total daily insulin, but no significant reduction A1C at week 26. However, like we just mentioned, it did show a benefit at week 13 and a slight potential risk of hypoglycemia and GI adverse events. With pioglitazone, it showed a significant reduction, no significant reduction in total daily insulin and A1C, and there is associated increased weight gain and potential for moderate hypoglycemia. And lastly, with loragotide, this showed benefits with a reduction A1C, body weight, and total daily insulin, specifically with 1.8 and 1.2 milligram strengths of loragotide, but was associated with symptomatic hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia with ketosis, and uh, GI adverse events, specifically nausea. So maybe these results can really help us think through on which agent may be beneficial for RM. So at the end of the day, adjunctive insulin sensitizing agents may provide some benefit in select double diabetic patients, although at the expense of potential side effects. Also, it's important to note that when using any insulin sensitizing agents in patients with double diabetes, its use is considered off-label and requires close monitoring as well as patient compliance. So I've created this algorithm for guidance on initiating the most appropriate insulin sensitizing agent in patients with double diabetes. 
assuming that they have no contraindications for their use. So looking first, asking the question, does a patient possess significant risk of symptomatic hypoglycemia and ketoacidosis? Things, uh, risk factors include having poor health literacy, med compliance and adherence issues, hypoglycemic unawareness, history of hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia with ketoacidosis, and those having an inconsistent diet. If there is concern, if there's no concerns with that, then I would say consider metformin 500 milligram daily with the goal of two grams per daily, two grams per day. If no, if there is a uh, patient, there's no risk for those, then asking the next question, does a patient have insurance and affordability concerns? Remember that these patients, these medications are off label use. And so insurances are likely not gonna be able to cover these. So taking that in consideration, if the patient does have affordability, affordability issues, then I would consider metformin since it's relatively cheap. If no, then I would consider loragotide 0.6 milligram daily with a, tight, with a goal to titrate to 1.8 milligrams per day. And I put a little asterisk next to the, the uh, to our agents because it is recommended that depending on the patient's current uh, glucose levels, it is recommended a 10 to 20% insulin dose reduction um, in those that are relatively uh, controlled. Again, I'd really like to emphasize the importance that this final recommendation is more for clinical guidance. Um, as you know, we're making this intervention, it definitely requires the use of our best clinical judgment and of course, close patient follow-up and monitoring. Prior to initiation and periodically after starting treatment, it's important to monitor each of the following. So the patient's renal uh, function as well as their current diet, their personal and family history of any pertinent disease states, and monitor for signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia with ketoacidosis. Now back to RM. He's a 41-year-old male with a past medical history of type 1 and hypertension and has a history of DKA and pancreatitis, whose A1C and BMI have increased significantly while on high insulin requirements, with a total daily insulin of one unit per keg per day. With what we learned, what do you think we should do to help get his diabetes back on track? Should we A, adjust his insulin and start pioglitazone, B, adjust his insulin and start metformin, C, adjust his insulin and start loragotide, or D, still not 100% sure, and I think there's still some trolley work that needs to be done. And you can go ahead and submit your answer via the chat or um, go ahead and speak over uh, uh, voice. Okay, give it a couple more seconds to see if anyone else wants to take a shot at this. Okay, so it looks like I got a B in the answer chat and that's correct. Let's see. Okay, not sure what's going on here, but um, I would choose pioglitazone uh, given, or sorry, I would choose metformin. I would not choose pioglitazone given its minimal benefits on A1C reduction and decreased total daily insulin doses as we previously discussed. Most importantly with pioglitazone um, can be associated with weight gain. And that kind of goes against what our end goal is, is trying to reduce weight um, so we can reduce insulin requirements. And lastly, with loragotide, although it's definitely an attractive option and has everything that we want of decreasing weight decreasing A1C as well as decreasing total daily insulin. RM has had a recent hospitalization for DKA and pancreatitis. So at this time, I would not preference GLP-1s. Let's see, For some reason it is not letting me. I'm wondering if you may need to stop sharing and then try to share again, I'm not sure. No, I got it now. For some reason it was just okay. not clicking. <laughs> um, but in summary, so with type one patients, you know, with a family history of type two, uh, overweight and obesity and insulin resistance definitely serves as a simple clinical marker to help identify those who may be at high risk of having double diabetes. 
And given the benefits of insulin synthesizing agents that we have, have shown in decreasing insulin requirements in type 2, they hold the potential for being acceptable agents in double diabetes. And with the limited literature that we have on the use of insulin sensitizers in double diabetes, um, it definitely suggests that our most common ones, such as metformin and uh, loragotide, or specifically other GLP ones, may reduce insulin, total daily insulin requirements, uh, weights, but potentially at the risk of adverse drug events, such as hypoglycemia. So definitely having to take that consideration, um, like previously mentioned, of the safety considerations and monitoring for each patient on deciding um, what would be more beneficial, um, as well as taking the algorithm in consideration, what would be more beneficial and safe for the patient in starting if it is chosen to um, start a new therapy or insulin sensitizing agent. So here are my references, um, and you can see these, I believe you'll have access to these um, after my presentation, but um, I wanted to spend time just to thank everybody for attending, um, taking time out of your lunch to attending my presentation, and I will take any questions, comments from the audience um, with the time that we have available. I don't see any in the chat box, but if anybody is so brave as to um, want to put something in the chat box or to unmute and comment, please feel free to do so. Dr. Godinez, are you okay with me? Um, providing these references through an email that I send out then? Um, would it be just the references or the, the slides themselves? Um, either or. Um, okay. you, know, you can share my slides as well, just so uh, people can kind of see the uh, references at the bottom of the slide and then kind of refer back to the actual reference section so they can um, see the full um, citation and, and um, visit that if, if they wish to do so. Okay, so I will save that. Um, and send to everybody that attended today. That way they have that information. Um, but if there are no other questions, I see there are some comments in there. Um, thanking you for an excellent and a great presentation. So thank you very much um, for joining us today as well and for presenting to us. Um, I will, with that, um, thank everybody else as well for joining us. But if you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me or Dr. Godinez, and I'll, I'll put the information in the email that I sent here later today. Perfect. Well, thank you all, everybody, for the comments, and thank you, everybody, for uh, attending my presentation. Thank you so much.